I want to tell you tonight a story for the young people, and then a story for the older people, and then have a serious Bible study, and we'll start. So I was one day in our cafeteria there in Malaysia. I was eating when I saw a troop of monkeys running along the ground. Now when monkeys are in the forest, when they're up in the trees, they jump helter-skelter wherever they care to be. They really aren't in a line. But when monkeys are on the ground, they look a bit like soldiers, equidistant, one after another, ding, 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 they're running. And they were running from our banana orchard to the jungle, which means I know what was going on. They had just finished eating. And so I was watching them go, ding, 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 just like that, when I saw one monkey that was tardy. Do you know the word tardy? He was late. And he wasn't equidistant from the rest. He was further behind. He was taking his time. Probably he had a bit much to eat. And as he was working his way along the ground, all of his friends had made it to a good jungle tree. They were all together there when I saw the most interesting thing happen. Around the corner of our building came running a black dog named Jackie. Jackie is a boy, but someone named him with a girl's name, and that just happens sometimes. And Jackie was so excited to see a monkey on the ground. Jackie didn't bark. Jackie didn't growl. Jackie just ran as fast as he could, and the monkey wasn't paying enough attention. She didn't see Jackie coming until he was only eight or nine feet away. And at that point, she was hardly moving, and he was moving fast, and there was nothing the monkey could do. Jackie bit that monkey hard. (laughs) And I thought I was going to see a monkey die. But as I looked, Jackie, holding on to the monkey, looked up. And that made me look up. And what I saw in the tree was every monkey in the tree quickly coming down. The whole troop was coming right to the ground fast. And you know what Jackie did? Jackie let go of that monkey, and he ran away as fast as he could go. (laughs) Because Jackie against one monkey, Jackie wins. But Jackie against 20 monkeys, monkeys win. That's the story for the children, but I want to say something to the adults about it, so let me talk to them for a minute. Do you know... Sometimes adults, you know someone in your local church that's a bit like that monkey. I mean, not everyone is paying enough attention. Not everyone is really being careful. Not everyone is keeping up to speed. Some people eat too much. I mean, there's a lot of ways where people are a lot like that monkey. And I want you to imagine the story the way it didn't happen. Imagine that Jackie bites the monkey And you, those here, you're up in the tree and looking down. In fact, let's back up and you see Jackie coming. And you begin to say to the one beside you something like this. This is so sad. I don't want to look. That monkey is going to die. You know it's his fault. We're all up here safe in the tree. I'm glad you're in the tree. You know, monkeys can't climb, I mean, dogs can't climb trees. We're safe up here. If he'd been paying attention, he'd be up here too. Right? I mean, he's really getting what he was bargaining for. He wasn't paying attention, he wasn't moving out, and now look at him. I mean, this is terrible. If the monkeys had been talking like that in the tree, what would have happened to the monkey on the ground? for certainly that would have been his last moment. But I'm talking about your local churches right now. It's when someone makes a big mistake, it's very nice for you and I to have a talk about it, kind of like this. 
did you hear what happened to so-and-so? I don't know how he could have done such a thing. He wasn't paying any attention. He should have been on the ball. It's easy to talk like that, but I'd like you to consider trying next time is to hurry up and go visit that person. Amen. To hurry up and get right there. To just go and say, what can I do? How can I help? Probably when those monkeys came down, they didn't need to say to that poor bitten monkey, shame on you. Don't you think there was enough shame already? They probably would be better if they just asked, how are you feeling? Although I'm sure I know how he was feeling. That hurt. Jackie has teeth. You know, dogs do. They have two sharp ones, those canines. That sounds like dog, like dog eyes. Those are sharp teeth. And uh, so I'm sure the monkey was hurting. But those monkeys weren't coming down to rebuke or to reprove or to correct. They were coming down to help. I don't say there isn't a place for reproof and correction. There's a place while you're marching along the ground to say, hey, come on, hurry up. There's a place to say, come on. There's a place when you're there in the tree to say, now we're about to leave. Are you ready to go? There's a place for correction. There's a place for rebuke. There is. But I'll tell you, in the midst of a terrible trouble is not the place. Right? In the midst of a terrible trouble isn't the place. The trouble itself gives the correction. What people need in terrible trouble is help. So that story for the children is also useful for you some. Now for the adults. I was walking along the road. This was a day after I met Aoub when I saw someone I wanted to talk to. I call him the noble farmer. I mean, here's what I could tell. I could tell from his face and what he was wearing and where he was that he had been farming for many years, probably decades. I could see he was producing good uh, vegetables, high quality cabbage, for example, and some other things that were growing there. And I could see that he had a kind disposition by looking in his face. And I know that farming is good for character. So I thought, of all the Muslims in this area, this is a good prospect for me. I want to talk to him. And so I said, hello. And that's when I found out that Noble Farmer doesn't speak English. And he said to me, hello in Indonesian, which is about how much Indonesian I know. And so we found out right away we can't communicate. So as I'd walk by him every day, because I walk. I walked eight miles yesterday morning. You can ask me about that sometime if you want. And uh, I, I walk. I like to walk. Every day when I would see him, I would wave at him and smile at him, but I can't talk. Then, on one of my last days there, a girl named Yvonne wanted to talk to me. She wanted to talk to me about relationships, about a special boy, and about her issues, and she's about 30, and I'm 46.9, and uh, I just don't talk to girls about things like that unless my wife is with me. So I said that, uh, how would you like to walk with Heidi and I tomorrow? And she was okay with that. If she hadn't been, it would have been no going. But she was okay with that. So the next day, it's Heidi and I and Yvonne, and we're talking. And, you know, on the topic of you and your relationships, I can run all the things to say real quick. I, I just have a few sad stories to tell and a little bit of advice, and I'm all done. And, uh, but she still wanted more. And I'm, I have already exhausted my repertoire of information. And so I said, let's turn around which is a way of saying, you know, that we're half done already. And so on the way back, I saw a noble farmer. Ivan knows English and Indonesian. I said, Ivan, can you help me? 
She said, what? I said, come over here. And Ivan became my translator. And now Noble Farmer and I began talking. He told me his name, but I don't remember it, so he's going to be Noble Farmer for you. And uh, he invited us into his home. And as we talked, I found out that he struggles with smoking. He'd like to quit, but he can't. Like about every male in the whole island of Java. And there are like 70 million males in the island of Java. But they don't, some of them are babies. So anyway, so he would like to quit. And as I explained to him, I can arrange for a stop smoking seminar right here in your living area. Do you think you could invite anyone else to come? He said, yes, my son and my son-in-law. They were right there. They were farmers too working right there. And so I made arrangements for Mr. Noble Farmer to learn about how Jesus can help them learn to overcome their addictions. So I was talking to someone from there recently, who had been there recently, and uh, she told me that Mr. Noble Farmer is looking forward to the next time I come to Indonesia and that he's still in contact and taking studies there. And I'm so happy to hear it. Is there any lesson in that story at all? There is something. I wish you'd keep your eyes open and look for noble farmers. I mean, I wish that when you're going around doing your business, that you wouldn't forget about your business. That as you go around doing your business, you'd be looking for people and thinking, maybe that one, maybe that one, let's talk to that one, and that you'd start talking. Because getting started is how you get started. And that you, someone, some people ask me, how do you know what to say? I'm gonna answer that for you. I don't. I just start. I found out I can freak myself out by trying to figure out what to say. If I sit there and try to figure out just what to say, I won't say anything. I just have to get moving. That's the adult story. That's for you. You have to get moving. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14 has in it the strongest, the most harshly isn't the right adverb. It has in it perhaps the most solemn warning anywhere in the scripture. Revelation 14 and looking at verse 9. And the third angel followed them. That word third is the reason we call these the three angels' messages. It's because if verse 9 is the third, then verse 8 must be the second, and then verse 6 must be the first. Because that, that's, how we, that's the logic that we go through. That's how we divide these up. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Do you know that big word, indignation? It's like anger. And he, that is the one that receives the mark, and he shall be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. That's just serious stuff. Don't you think that's serious stuff? Yeah. It looks like in Revelation 13 and 14 that the whole world is going to be tested over the seal of God and the mark of the beast. Everyone is going to be tested over this. It's going to be either you receive the mark or you receive the seal. You won't get both and you will get one. That's how it's going to be. It's pretty obvious in Revelation 13 and 14 it's that way. So that makes me think as a teacher, I should ask you, can you give off the cuff a Bible study on the mark of the beast and the seal of God? 
If you can't, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. How you could know about this warning, unless you've really tried to figure it out and you haven't managed, that would make sense. If you've really tried to be able to do that and you can't, well, then okay. But if you haven't tried, it doesn't make any sense at all. How you could believe the whole world is going to be tested and you don't even know how to tell them how to be on the right side. One of the most embarrassing moments of my life, I was all by myself. There was nobody around. Maybe you can't imagine being embarrassed when you're all by yourself. But someone, a young person, sent me an email that had a passage in it that threw so much light on this issue of the mark of the beast and the seal of God, it just embarrassed me terribly that I didn't already know it. I was thinking, how can I have been already someone who ought to know this for like 20 years and I didn't even know about this passage? What's wrong with me? That's what I was thinking and I was very embarrassed. It's Deuteronomy 6. Would you look there? Deuteronomy chapter 6 comes right after Deuteronomy chapter 5. And I'm mentioning that because Deuteronomy 5 has the Ten Commandments. If you glance over at chapter 5, you might even see some of those really short verses and then you'll recognize them when you look at them. But go to chapter 6. Do you see 6 verse 5? It says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. Where should the Ten Commandments be? They should be in your heart. And you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your strength, all your mind, all your soul. You should really, your whole energy should be there, but his law should be in your heart. You can see that. We're going to go on, but first go back to chapter 5 and look at verse 27. This is the same page for you. The people are saying to Moses, you go close to God and listen to all that the Lord our God will say, and you speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you, and we will hear it and do it. They said, Moses, we've had enough of thunder and lightning. We have had enough of this loud trumpet sound. The brightness and smoke are a bit over the top for us. From now on, we don't need God to speak to us directly. We accept you as our mediator. Would you please just directly go to God and just come back and tell us what he said? Now my question to you to think about is, was it, is that good or bad what they're saying? Don't answer. I mean, if you did, it's okay, but look at the next verse. Verse 28. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken unto you. They have well said all that they have spoken. So what was it? Good or bad what they said? Good. It was good. It's good that you and I don't crave to have God speak to us personally, that we are content to have the prophets bring us the message. It's good that we recognize who we are and where we are in this situation. That's good. Verse 29, God is continuing, Oh, that there was such a heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. On what condition is God able to bless Israel? having the law in the heart. If they have it there, if the law is written in the heart, then they can obey with some level of consistency. If the law isn't in the heart, there's no consistency at all. Do you see it there in verse 29? It's, it's the word always. Oh, that there was such a heart in them, he said. Without having a changed heart, there's no way they can do it. 
that this idea that being born again is a New Testament concept is not true. It is a whole Bible concept. It's always been true that people need to be born again. That's right from the very beginning. And right here, what you're reading about in these two verses is the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant is people making a good promise we're going to obey. But unfortunately, they can't follow through. They don't have a changed heart, and they can't manage to be obedient enough to warrant the blessing of God. They can't do it, and therefore, they end up having condemnation. Oh, that there is such a heart in them, is what God said. Go back to chapter 6. Do you see it's the same idea that we saw in chapter 6, verse 6? And these words which I command you this day shall be where? It's the same idea. I hope you see it. Verse 7. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children, and talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. How is it that the law of God ends up in the hearts of our children? It's by a great deal of informal talking about God's principles. It is a, a great deal of informal communicating uh, at the table where you're going, what you're doing, making sure they know God's principles, talking them up, speaking about them. That's how it works. That is, you're old enough as adults to choose those principles for yourself, but some of your children are too young for that. Some of them are plenty old for that, by the way. But some are too young for that, and the ones that are too young, what they need to hear is how valuable those principles are to you. They need to see it and know it, and that's how the law ends up in their heart. That's education. Education is very important in Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Malaysia, we're starting primary schools. My students are starting primary schools. One of them named Priscilla is right now organizing to start one right away. The mission in Sabah where she is have said that she's not permitted to do it. Anyway, she's going to do it. And no one said amen. You didn't know what to say and that's okay. Maybe you're wondering, why did they say that? It's because they're a little worried that the school might teach her principles. And they think her principles are a bit extreme. Well, anyway, they got the first part right. The school is going to teach her principles. They got that part right. The second part, they don't have right. So she's not upset with them. She's not bitter against them. I just explained to her, Priscilla, as, you're, as people talk to you about this, make sure everything you say about the mission is positive. And then if the mission says something about you the other way, the people will figure out right away where the negativity is. Amen. Did you understand what I just said? Yes. That's what I said, to, and, and she wrote back, oh good, that's a good idea. That Priscilla is precious. She's, right now, Priscilla is having a little bit of a hard time in life. Her parents are so angry at me because she was one of those super gifted kids that can become a doctor, a good doctor. And she had a full scholarship to study medicine there in Malaysia. And she was on her way to, make, to become a good doctor. And doctors in Penang can make enough money to lift their family right out of poverty. And her family, they're rubber tappers. That means they, they don't make much money at all. They're poor. And so Priscilla was their hope to get out of that. And now Priscilla is going into a field that won't make any money at all. And they are so upset. But you know, Priscilla understands the relation between education and the seal of God. 
And she knows that these young people need to get a head start in understanding these things. I have two students. One of them is named Jerome, and one is named um, Belsie. Belsie might be coming to study here in America soon. They both told me recently that uh, both of them, when they got to the age of 16, 17, 18, 19, they wanted to know more. They wanted to understand the Bible. They wanted to understand how salvation works. And when they began asking hard questions to the people around them, the people seemed irritated or perplexed with their questions and kind of pushed them away, kind of like, you don't need to know. Don't worry about it. I'll get with you later. Oh, I don't have time. And really, in both cases, when they did that, Jerome and Belsey lost the interest they had. And they both wandered in the world for some years, and it cost them something being in the world. And now they've come out, and now they're faithful missionaries, and one of them's already spent some time in jail. But what they said is they wish someone had taught them when they were 17 instead of when they were 24. Amen. Amen. So that's what's going on is we're going to start teaching them when they're 10 and when they're 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17 and making sure they have a good chance before they have to have that problem. Look at verse 8. Verse 6 said, the law should be in your heart. Verse 7 said it should be in your children's heart because of education. Verse 8 is the metaphor of those things. It says it'll be like frontlets between your eyes or like a mark, what's the word it uses? A sign on your hand. Do you know that this verse is the origin of the metaphors in Revelation of the mark of the beast and the seal of God? This is where it begins, right here. Right here in Deuteronomy, God said very literally, the law of God should be in your heart so that you can follow through and obey it. Then as a metaphor, he said, it's like something between your eyes or something on your hand. That's not the literal, that's the metaphor. What's the literal? The law should be in your heart. Look at Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to read a few things there. Hebrews chapter 8, and we're going to look at verse 6. It's contrasting Jesus with Moses. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Hebrews 8, verse 6. But now he, that is Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a, what does it say? A better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Was Moses a mediator of a covenant? He was. We read it in Deuteronomy 5. Did the people say a good thing? They said a good thing. They said, Moses, you be the mediator. You go and get the message, bring it to us. So what's the problem? If they said a good thing, what was the problem with that old covenant? The heart wasn't changed. They, they couldn't follow through. They were sincere, but they weren't capable. That was the problem. What about Jesus? He's the mediator of a better covenant based upon better promises. Let's look at the promises. Look down at verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would be no place needed or sought for the second. For finding fault with them, the fault with the first covenant was fault with what? Was it the covenant itself or the people? Pretty clear there in verse 8, isn't it? He found fault with them. Well, we know because we read it in Deuteronomy. What was the fault he found with them? He said, oh, that there was such a heart in them. So that was the fault he found. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. That part about continuing not, did that take God by surprise or did he anticipate it? 
we saw in Deuteronomy 5 that he anticipated it. He said, oh, that there was such a heart in them that they might continue always. It says here in verse 10, uh, verse 9, they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. Verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they will be to me a people. There's a nice part of the covenant in verse 12. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Someone says, why is it called a new covenant? It's not because it's the, it's not because the older covenant is older. That wasn't good English. Let me start that over. I mean, what we read here called the New Covenant is called all through the Bible the Everlasting Covenant. The phrase Everlasting Covenant is much more common in Scripture than the phrase New Covenant. And they're referring to the very same thing. Why is the Old Covenant called old? It's because it doesn't last long. Why is the New Covenant called new? It's because the New Covenant depends on Jesus. It's the one that offers forgiveness. His mercy is offered in the new covenant. What he says, it's not, it's not like this. If you let me write the law in your heart, then you are good enough to be forgiven. Nothing like that at all. It's like this. I will write the law in your heart and I will forgive you. These are two different gifts and, and we need them both. I liked what Pastor Saman was saying earlier today when he was talking about the gifts that God gives. You know, if I give you a gift, you might not need it. But if God gives you a gift, and you, can you say, I don't need it? That wouldn't be very polite, right? So he gives us gifts, and we need both. We need the forgiveness of verse 12. We need the conversion that's in verse 10. We need the whole thing. So the covenant is real. I mean, it's in your life. It's part of you. What's the metaphor of that? It's like something between your eyes, something on your hand. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 8. When you go to Isaiah 8, you almost always go to verse 20. Not tonight. Isaiah 8, we're going to look at verse 16. Isaiah 8 and verse 16. Bind up... I hear you turning. I should just wait. Isaiah 8, verse 16. There's a relation between 8 and 16, you mathematicians. 16 is twice 18. I mean, twice 8, sorry. 8 is 2 to the 3rd. 16 is 2 to the 4th power. That might help at least one person remember this reference. <laughs> Isaiah 8, 16... Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Let me ask you a question from the verse. Which happens first in verse 16? You are his disciple or you are sealed? You're a disciple first. And in verse 16, when he wants to put the seal on you, he seals you with the law. Does that make good sense in view of what we've already seen tonight? It makes very good sense, doesn't it? We're sealed with the law. The law is how he seals us. He puts the law in our heart. That is, you might serve Jesus before you really understand the principles of the law. One of the favorite authors of many people in the English language is John Bunyan. I bet many of you have read at least one or two books by John Bunyan. And John Bunyan was a prolific writer. I used to own three volumes of everything he had written that it was published anyway. It, it's like three big encyclopedia books. It's a lot of writing. He even put some Bible books to poetry. He was just gifted, but you might not know, he wrote an entire book against the Seventh-day Sabbath. Don't worry, he'll still be in heaven. I mean, I'm not, no, I don't know that, but I reckon. I reckon he will be. 
you might wonder how could a man that's connected to God who's doing so much mission work I mean when you write a book against the Sabbath that's not like your great grandma who just never knew right we let the great grandma off because no one ever told her but isn't this a different case obviously someone exposed him to the idea obviously someone tried to persuade him and he is writing a whole book fighting against it well let me just tell you his fundamental argument the one at the base of the thing and I'll see if you can find the hole in it if you can't you might be on your way out of the church he was in prison and in prison, he was doing prison ministry and converting people in prison. The people that were with him in prison weren't all there for the same reasons he was. There were thieves there, and there were crooks there, and, and they were being converted by the word of God. He had a lot of it in his mind. He loved to preach, and he was doing a good job there. He knew about the new covenant, that in the new covenant, God puts his law where? In the heart. And he came up with an experiment to see whether the Sabbath is part of the law of God. He watched these converted men when they were converted, and he watched to see the change that would happen. You know, they stopped stealing. They stopped cussing. They become sweeter in disposition. But they don't become Sabbath keepers. He watched right there in prison. They did not become, the next Saturday, they were not like keeping the Sabbath. They were totally unaware of it. And when he watched that, he saw, so at conversion, God wrote the law in their heart. And here comes Sabbath, they're not keeping it. Obviously, the Sabbath is not part of the law. Bye-bye. <coughs> no, no. Can anyone tell me what's wrong with that argument? What, what do you say? Nobody taught them. Okay, I'm going to say your right answer in a different way. D did you hear the gentleman? He said nobody taught them. What he's saying is that the law is written incrementally. This work of writing the law in your heart is called sanctification. It's a process so that God writes the law in your heart, but he never does it without your permission. So what he does is he presents to you truth, you submit to that, and that's written in. He presents to you more, you accept that, and it's written in. So those men in the prison, they had known, probably from their mom, that they shouldn't be cussing. And they knew from society they shouldn't be stealing. And they might have learned from Mr. Bunyan himself a few other things. And when they gave their life to Jesus, they submitted to what they knew. And that's the, what was written in their heart. If God had written the Sabbath in their hearts, that would have been without any choice on their part. It's like that they, it's, it'd be just the same as making you into a spiritual robot. Of course, it's not the way things work. I don't even fault Mr. Bunyan for not seeing it because no one taught him either. Sometimes as Adventists, we talk a little bit funny we say the Sabbath is the seal of God. Then, three or four weeks later, when we're not thinking about that, we'll say the sealing is a settling into the truth intellectually and spiritually so that you cannot be moved. Anyone here ever said both things? Anyone here never said either one? Anyone here, like German, you don't raise hands? <laughs> And uh, so I want to help you resolve that a little bit tonight. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus 31. Exodus 31. And we're going to look at 13. 31 and 13 have a relation to each other. They're mirror images of each other. That might help one of you learn that reference. 31 and 13. Exodus 31 and verse 13. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, 
Verily, my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does what? Sanctify Sanctify you. The Sabbath is a sign of sanctification. Now, what I've tried to share with you tonight is to understand what the meaning of sanctification, to understand it in the kind of words that are used in Hebrews 8. Uh, How is it described there? It's the writing of the law in the heart. heart. So the Sabbath is a sign of the law being written in the heart. If you understand that, you'll see that the sealing process, writing the law in the heart, it has a, a metaphor, an illustration of it that God has given to his people. What's the metaphor or the illustration of this process? It's the Sabbath. The Sabbath isn't sanctification. It's the sign of sanctification. So if you want to say the Sabbath is the seal of God, that's okay. That means you're talking like Revelation 7, where it's talking about the seal in the forehead. Well, that's the metaphor. The Sabbath is is to be like an illustration of what's going on in the heart. The Sabbath teaches you about that. The Sabbath is the sign of the sealing process. But if you want to talk about what the sealing process is, it's the writing the law in the heart. Because of the way the law is written in the heart, it has to be both intellectual and spiritual. If it's not intellectual, that means you don't understand it. It's certainly not in your heart. If it's not spiritual, it means that you're not really committed to it. That's not in your heart either. So, of course, it has to be intellectually and spiritually. Writing the law in the heart, the new covenant... That is the sealing process. What's the sign of it? The Sabbath Sabbath is the sign of that. Now let's review some things you already know and plug them into this picture. In Daniel chapter 3, there is a story. You're in the nation of Babylon. The king makes a law to disobey the Ten Commandments, and he enforces it with a death decree. What kind of death decree? That's the fiery furnace. And the three friends, they stand up to the king, and when he gives them a second chance, they say, no thanks. Do you remember that in in Daniel 3? They say, we are not careful to answer you in this matter, O king. That made him extremely furious. Therefore, he had them thrown into the furnace, and that worked out just fine, right? So now you go to Daniel chapter 6. In Daniel 6, it's a different king. It's a different nation. It's a different godly man. It's a different law. It's a different punishment. But it's the exact same plot. There is a law that says you break the Ten Commandments, namely the first one in this case. You break the Ten Commandments. You have... The king of Persia wanted to be uh, ahead of the other gods, the only one, for 30 days. There's a law that breaks the Ten Commandments, and how is it enforced? With a death decree. And so Daniel is thrown into the den of lions, and how does that work out? It works out okay. I mean, some people would say both stories end kind of sad because... In both cases, the people that were enforcing the decree died. Right? In both cases. Do you know Revelation takes those two stories and builds it into a prophecy? That's Revelation 13. Revelation 13, in just a few verses, takes that plot and just paints it again. There you have a nation. It's not named there but it ends up making a law that obviously is against the Ten Commandments because faithful people won't obey it. And those faithful people are threatened with death. That's what happened in Revelation 13, the last five verses. It's the exact same plot of Daniel 3 and Daniel 6. Do you see that? Now turn back to Revelation 14 and let's just look at some things. Revelation 14 is where we started tonight. Revelation 14, 
And I want you to see that the people who don't receive the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast, we read verses 9 through 11. Do you remember that? About 30 minutes ago, verses 9 to 11. The people who don't receive the mark, look at what it says about them in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I'm just checking to see what's going on. Now I know. What does it say in verse 12? The people who receive the mark of the beast obviously aren't the commandment keepers. And the commandment keepers obviously are the ones who did not receive the mark of the beast. What that tells us is that the mark of the beast is somehow, it, there's a contrast between receiving it and keeping the commandments. That is, either you receive the mark in 9 to 11 or you keep the commandments in verse 12. Do you see you can't possibly be in both categories? You can't possibly. So it's one of the two. Now look back at verses 6 and 7, the first message. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth and to every kindred and nation and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is... <laughs> Worship him that what? Made. Made heaven and earth. It's quoting there from the fourth commandment in the Septuagint. But you don't have to know that. It's close enough to the fourth commandment even in whatever version you're using. So you see right there a reference to the fourth commandment and the first message. That's the way we honor God as creator. So when you look at these three messages, you see one group honors God as creator. They must be the same group that keep the commandments. And the others are the one that received the mark of the beast. When you just look at that and think about it, you would realize the ones that received the mark of the beast must not be the ones that honor him as creator. Do you see that, what I'm talking about? What we're working towards is answering the question, what kind of law is going to be made against the Ten Commandments? We're looking for hints. Now turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to look at verse 21. There is also a relation between 7 and 21, but it's not so profound. But 7 times 3 is 21. 721, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works, read miracles. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, Depart from me, you that work lawlessness, is what the New King James says, and it's a pretty good translation of that word. Those that break laws. Those that break laws. What I want you to see in Matthew 7 is that those that receive the mark of the beast sincerely think that they're worshiping Jesus. Do you see it? I mean, it has to be the same period of time because this is when Jesus comes back, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same period. And these people, you know they're sincere. If they weren't sincere, they would not say that to Jesus. They might say it to you, but they would not say it to Jesus. But do they say it to Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. They say it to him. What convinced them that they for sure were on the right side? It was the miracles. When they cast out a demon they must have the power of God. When they're, when they're able to work a miracle, they must have the power of God. When they, when they have that experience, they know, like, who's deceived by the miracles? It's the miracle workers. But what you see here is that these people who are serving Jesus, he accuses them of being lawbreakers. Now, what kind, which of the Ten Commandments can you violate and still think of yourself as a sincere, miracle-working follower of Jesus. 
It probably isn't the one where you take his name in vain. It probably isn't the one where you steal or kill. Probably not the one where you commit adultery or bow down to Buddha. You know, the fourth commandment is the likely one. And it matches just what we see there in Revelation. It matches what we saw already, that the Sabbath is the sign of this sealing process. And then when you learn in Daniel, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to show you just a little bit more, and then, and then I'll refer you to the book if you want to get it. It has a 20-page chapter on this topic, The Mark of the Beast and the Seal of God. But look at Daniel chapter 7. Maybe, actually go to Daniel 11, because you already know about Daniel 7, and Daniel 11 is what you don't know about. Daniel 7 is where it says in verse 25 that he will think to change times and laws. I want you to go to chapter 11 and see the same idea. So if you don't know Daniel 7, you can go ahead and look there and check me. In 725, that, that evil power that's called Babylon Revelation, in 725, tries to change God's law. It thinks to do that. But for the rest of you, turn to chapter 11 and look down at verse 28. Revel Did I say Revelation? I meant Daniel. Daniel 11, verse 28. Then shall he return. He is that same power. He shall return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the what? The holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. What you see here is that that Roman power is in heart against the covenant. The covenant that does what? It writes the law in the heart. It identifies those people with the law as being God's people, and it offers free and full forgiveness and cleansing. Now, the Roman power is in heart against that. Look at verse 30. For the ships of Chittim, that's talking about the vandals in illustration there that came up from North Africa. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore he will be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy what? the holy covenant. So shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Look down at verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. I don't know if you saw the word exploits twice in those three verses. Some of those exploits were done by wicked people, but the last ones were done by the good people. What you have in Daniel 11 is a contrast between an evil Roman power that's in heart, against the, in heart against the Holy Covenant, contrasted with God's people that really know him, that are getting great things done. They're the ones that are experiencing the, the Holy Covenant. They have the law written in their heart, and God says, you are my people, and he says, I am your God. They have forgiveness. So I wrote down a lot, a lot more verses on my notes tonight than we've gone over. But I want to summarize what we've said because I think that you've had about as much as a mind can take for a night. What, what we've said in the story for the children is if you find yourself in the tree looking down at someone being bitten by Jackie, get down. Don't talk and don't wait. In our church plant that we planted in, in Arkansas, there was a lady that lived with my wife and I for a while, and she joined the church after she quit smoking and did some other things, and her children, she was baptized, two of her children were baptized. And uh, to make a sad story short, some things went wrong and she stopped going to church. She stopped. And when she stopped going to church, the pastor called and asked if he could come visit her. He called a few times, and uh, she was busy. She didn't have time. She had things she needed to do. Really, probably you understand what was really going on is that she was embarrassed and didn't really want to talk to him. The head elder called and wanted to visit, but she was busy and didn't have time. So I saw her the summer before this summer 
and this summer, but two summers ago I, I saw her and she said something to me that was so interesting. This is several years after that experience. She said, no one ever visited me. Well, don't call, just go. Don't ask permission, just get out of your tree. Just get right over there and see what you can do. If you try to get permission, you might not get it. You just need to go and get involved. Then there was a story for the adults. And that is, please have your eyes open for the noble farmer. You know, there are people out there that their heart is probably better than yours. And God highlights them for you if your eyes are open. You'll see them do noble things. And when you see that, I hope you'll be thinking, that's someone that ought to know. That's someone that ought to have a chance. And I hope that because probably, they, you, and probably you know the same language they know. So it's a little easier. You don't need Yvonne to help you. I hope that you'll interact with them and get to know them and see what you can do. Then the Bible study tonight was on the seal of God and the mark of the beast. We got about halfway through it. What you saw is that Revelation draws its metaphors from elsewhere, and this metaphor is drawn especially from Deuteronomy 6 and from Exodus 13. I didn't show you that in a few other places, but it's drawn from several places where God illustrates the writing of the law in the heart by, by a mark between the eyes or a sign on the hand, never intended to be literal, but to show you how, how it should be always in front of your face. You should be thinking about it a lot. What we saw there is that your children need a good education. If you're homeschooling them, that's great. But if you're not, I hope you'll put them into a good Adventist school or start one. Someone says we can't afford to start one. Priscilla's going to do it with almost no money. You know, Jesus ran a school that didn't even have a building. It was a zero logistics problem school. <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is if you really have your heart in Christian education, you can find a way to help the young people. It, it doesn't require wealthy people to make it happen. They can make it happen with some more bells and whistles, but it can happen wherever you are, however you are. What God wants to do is to impress us with the fact that even though we promise to obey him, that we can't follow through. That our promises aren't good enough. We can't manage. And if we really promised and we were sincere, he's not condemning us for our sincere promise. He says it was a good promise you made, but you can't make it. You can't follow through. What you need is a new covenant. You need to have the law written in your heart. You need to have a miracle there. You need forgiveness. You need to have an experience. He used, Jesus our Savior used several metaphors for this experience. He called it the new birth. He called it being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Being baptized with or by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so I'm going to make an appeal tonight, and I hope every one of you will follow or will, will agree I'm going to ask you to try something that isn't even hard. I'm going to ask you for the next 40 days. Is today the 15th or 16th? The 16th of August. So 40 days on top of this would take you to about the 25th, I think, of, of September. I'm going to ask you for the next 40 days to every day to pray earnestly every day that God would baptize you or fill you with his Holy Spirit. You know why I say 40 days? No reason at all. It's just so if you do it for that long, you might do it for the rest of your life. That's the only reason. But it's, it's so you can, make a, you can make a commitment and maybe get in the habit and get in a good habit for that. Can I see the hands of those who would agree to pray that way for the next 40 days to see what, what God will do? Because I'll tell you more about that some other time. 
But I think you'll find that the new covenant works when you have a new experience. When you have that law written in your heart, it allows him to do things with you he's never done before. Then you can obey him with some consistency, and then he can bless you and your children. Until then, that we're running blind and he can't do a whole lot for us. In the meantime, your homework is to master this topic of the mark of the beast and the seal of God. To master it and memorize the references. You might say, I can't learn references. Well, you can learn 12 of them. I mean, if you've passed high school, you can. And if you didn't, you probably can do it anyway. You can learn 12 or 15 references, master this topic, discipline yourself, work on it some, make sure you got it, review yourself. You ought to know this stuff because this is what the test is going to be over. Just learning this topic well makes a lot of the other things seem like side issues, like they are. I mean, when you're learning the real thing, you realize that God shows a test that children can understand and old people need to study. He shows something that really separates sheep from goats instead of PhDs from associates. That he, he found something that will do the right trick. But you ought to learn the references so that when you're sitting beside someone on the bus and you start talking to them about the book they're reading, that you can do what you got to do. Right? Amen. You ought to. I'm asking you to do that too. If you're able and willing and happy to do that, kneel with me for a closing prayer. Our Father in heaven, I'm asking from you that you would find a way to bring the noble farmers to know the truth. And that if we are careless with it, that you would find a way to replace us with those noble farmers so that your truths can be shared widely and well. Would you please give us a new heart and fill us with your Holy Spirit? Baptize us in a way that would allow us to live in an, as an honor to you. I ask for that gift in the name of Jesus. Amen.